the perfect Manhattan couple. They seem good together. Trouble behind closed doors. This man had deep emotional problems. He had tremendous rage, and she was incredibly unhappy. An unsolvable mystery. There's no fingerprints, no forensic evidence. There's no body. He'll never get a conviction. It's an unwinnable case. A family determined. We knew who did it, and we couldn't get him. A brilliant surgeon executes the perfect murder. Tonight, on Power, Privilege, and Justice. In 1985, 30-year-old Dr. Robert Bierenbaum and his 29-year-old wife, Gail, appear to be the perfect Manhattan couple. He's a brilliant surgeon who pilots his own plane. She's getting her master's degree in psychology. But behind the closed doors of their Upper East Side apartment, the Bierenbaum's marriage is a battleground. Robert Bierenbaum once choked Gail into unconsciousness. A psychiatrist warned her that her life was in danger if she didn't leave him. Sunday morning, July 7th, 1985, Gail musters the courage to confront her husband. It's my suspicion that she told Bob that she wanted to leave him and she was seriously thinking about getting divorced. But Gail never gets a chance to go through with her plans. Around midnight, Bierenbaum phones Gail's parents on Long Island. Bob had called them saying, have you seen Gail? Everyone suspects she walked out on Bob, but days pass without a word. And when her mother goes to the couple's Manhattan apartment and finds Gail's purse with her wallet, keys, and cigarettes still inside, she fears something terrible has happened. It doesn't make any sense to us that if she goes out in a huff because she's had an argument, that she doesn't bring her pocketbook and cigarettes to go smoke. That's the kind of thing you do when you're upset. It turned from where is Gail to it's possible that Bob had something to do with Gail's disappearance. Investigators repeatedly questioned Bierenbaum about what happened on the day Gail disappeared. He always tells the same story. They had a fight, she walked out. I think his attitude and demeanor spoke volumes about him. My opinion was uh, he was the most likely person responsible for her disappearance. But there's no hard proof. And two years later, the unsolved disappearance of Gail Katz Bierenbaum is buried with the hundreds of other New York City cold cases. On paper, Robert Bierenbaum was a mother's dream come true. A smart, handsome doctor from a good family. He even flew his own plane. To Gail Katz's parents, Bob looked like the kind of guy who could turn their daughter's life around. Gail Katz was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1956. Her father, Manny, was an advertising executive, and her mother, Sylvia, was a homemaker. The family moved to North Belmore, Long Island, when Gail was nine and her younger sister, Elaine, was seven. Gail was a straight-A student, but from an early age, she was plagued by low self-esteem. My mother always blamed my sister's insecurity on her father, that somehow my father did not accept or love her enough. My father was the type of person that would yell and scream. He would keep a lot of his emotions in, but when they came out, they really came out. After graduating from high school, in 1973, Gail followed a boyfriend to the State University of New York at Albany. But when the romance fizzled, so did her interest in college. She always had a very intense relationship with a boy, usually went on for a long period of time, and she ended one when the next one started. Gail next hooked up with a rock musician and moved into a Manhattan apartment with him. She tried to find work in the music business, but ended up tending bar at a club called Tracks. Sylvia and Manny Katz were running out of patience. 
Let's face it, no parent is happy about a child dropped out of college, living with a man, doesn't have a college degree, and she has um, what they see as little future. By 1979, Gail was in a downward spiral with no boyfriend and no career. That year, at the age of 23, she attempted suicide. They brought her down to St. Vincent's Hospital, and um, I met her down there. She talked about having nothing to live for, about feeling like she had made bad choices and she was in a bad place. For the next year, Gail was in and out of psychiatric hospitals. But by 1981, she was starting a new life and got a receptionist job at a small graphic design firm. She also started dating again. In the fall, a girlfriend introduced Gail to 26-year-old Dr. Robert Bierenbaum. On one of their first dates, he rented a plane and flew her high above the Manhattan skyline. Gail was swept off her feet, and so was her family. Handsome, young, and Jewish. I think my mother is the one who first mentioned to me that he was, you know, a doctor. That was, you know, the Jewish mother's dream. Bob was from a family of doctors. His father, Marvin, was a wealthy and respected cardiologist in New Jersey. Expectations in the Bierenbaum household were high, and from an early age, Bob excelled. He was probably the most intelligent guy in school. In uh, junior high school, he was teaching the math teacher uh, calculus when we were studying algebra. This is a guy who had a very high opinion of himself, that he was raised essentially not just privileged in the sense of money or position, but in an aristocracy of the intellect. Gail and Bob had a whirlwind romance, and by spring 1982 were planning their wedding. But cracks soon began to appear in Bierenbaum's perfect facade. Bob became controlling and critical of his fiancée. What she wore, how she wore her hair, where she worked, how she spoke, there was nothing right about her. And one of Gail's habits set him off like nothing else. Bob hated smoking. He didn't want Gail to smoke. She was not supposed to smoke. Three weeks before their wedding bells were set to chime, the warning bells went off. Gail called her sister sobbing and hysterical. She came home to find Bob in the bathroom, holding the cat under the water in the toilet, trying to strangle the cat. Elaine was horrified and tried reasoning with Gail. I am saying, call off this wedding. You know, you're, you're nuts. Do not marry this man. Bob begged for forgiveness, but the writing was on the wall. Elaine Katz told her sister, let's get rid of Bob and keep the cat. But Gail didn't listen. On August 29th, 1982, in an Upper East Side synagogue, Gail Katz and Robert Bierenbaum exchanged vows. Even on her wedding day, Gail put Bob and his upscale family before her own happiness. Gail tried so hard to be the perfect daughter-in-law. She didn't really like the mother-in-law's wedding dress, but she used it. And that was clearly an attempt to curry favor with her husband's family. Gail was determined to be the wife Bob wanted her to be. After the wedding, she enrolled in New York's Hunter College, and soon, the former dropout was getting straight A's. In January 1983, the Bierenbaums moved into a luxurious apartment on East 85th Street, courtesy of Bob's affluent father. Going through medical school and internship and residency, they don't make a lot of money. They were being subsidized, and it was very helpful to them, and, and I think allowed them to have that period of time where things went well. But the Berenbaum honeymoon didn't last long. By the time Bob dragged himself home from those 36-hour shifts, he didn't have a lot of energy left for his new bride. You'd want to relax, and relax didn't mean talking to Gail. Relax meant sitting in front of a computer for hours. She was unhappy. She felt ignored. She felt frustrated. You know, here I am, I'm married. She'd say to me, I have no one to talk to. Then one night, Bierenbaum came home early 
and caught Gail sneaking a cigarette on the deck of their apartment. His rage came out of him. He couldn't control it. She really described him leaping over the couches, coming through the door to the deck, and putting his arms around her throat to strangle her, and pushing her, him going over with her. She's on the ground, he's on top of her, he's choking her, she loses consciousness. Gail went to the police and filed a complaint against Bob and insisted that he see a psychiatrist. Dr. Michael Stone met with both Bob and Gail in the days following the attack. This was well beyond the uh, average troubled marriage. But Dr. Stone was reluctant to treat Dr. Birnbaum. Dr. Stone was afraid of him. He didn't think it was treatable. He said to me, uh, he's psychopathic and you can't treat a psychopath. The psychiatrist also had a diagnosis for Gail. He calls it the Carmen syndrome, where this attractive, wild, free spirit is in love with danger. She was getting something from the danger, the threat, that most people would not. And most people, in fact, would flee. Dr. Stone warned Gail, staying with Berenbaum was putting her life at risk. And I said that uh, you're in danger and, and you need to uh, leave. Uh, the marriage, she said, uh, a woman's place is by her husband's side. Stone issued another warning to Gail, this one in the form of a declaration that he asked her to sign. He wrote her a letter absolving him of responsibility if she refused to leave him. If I do not heed this advice, I must accept the consequences, including the possibility of personal injury or death at the hands of my husband. Gail never signed the letter and kept it a secret from her family for almost a year. But by September 1984, she'd graduated from college and was finally considering divorce. She confided in her sister. That was when she first told me that because she had this letter, um, that Bob would give her, in terms of a settlement, whatever she wanted because he didn't want her to expose his incredible psychiatric dysfunction. She felt the need to have things like blackmail material. She was afraid that if she went, he would kill her. While quietly planning her exit strategy, Gail entered graduate school in psychology. Soon, she was keeping another secret from Bob. Gail was having an affair. She begun another relationship that she would call me and, and talk to me about and tell me that it was wonderful. By the 4th of July, Gail was ready to tell Bob she wanted out and she laid down her terms. The fireworks were about to begin. The mysterious 1985 disappearance of Gail Katz Birenbaum stumped investigators for years. They concluded that on Saturday, July 6th, Gail told her abusive husband Bob she wanted a divorce. She actually made up a specific list of demands of what she wanted in terms of property. There was a plan, there was an apartment. I need so much money from you. Birenbaum, not used to having anything dictated to him, was caught off guard. Gail told Bob that she'd saved the police report she'd filed when he choked her in 1983, as well as the psychiatrist's letter warning her that he was a risk to her life. She was going to show this letter that she got from Dr. Stone around and ruined his career. The Birenbaums fought late into the evening. On Sunday morning, Gail and Bob picked up their dispute where they left off. By 11 a.m., their battle reached a fever pitch. Dr. Birenbaum knew that she was about to leave him. Things got explosive. He couldn't stop the rage inside him that exploded out of him. I think it clicked in his mind that I no longer have control of what's gonna happen, made him snap. Around 6.30 that evening, Bob showed up at his nephew's birthday party in Upper Montclair, New Jersey. But Gail wasn't with him. At midnight, he went home to their apartment and phoned her parents in Long Island. 
that evening. I called my mother and she said to me, is Gail with you? And I said, no. And she said, Bob called, you know, he hasn't seen her all day. Um, they had a fight in the morning and she stormed out of the apartment and he hasn't seen her and he doesn't know where she is. It wasn't long before Gail's friends and family suspected there was more to the story than the good doctor was admitting. It was pretty soon that Bob wasn't exactly cooperating like he could have been, and that obviously got everybody's uh, suspicions up. 36 hours passed before Bob Berenbaum finally sauntered into NYPD's 19th precinct to report his wife missing. Alarm bells were ringing even before he opened his mouth. I noticed that he wasn't anxious way people are, you know. He was not concerned enough for me. The detective is telling me, your brother-in-law is strange, I don't like him, I'm getting a bad vibe from him. Gail's family and friends felt the same way. They gathered each day at Gail and Bob's apartment to distribute missing persons posters around the neighborhood. But it didn't feel like a united effort. When they're in the park hanging up posters, it's like two camps. Bob is saying things like Gail was depressed. Bob's father is saying things like maybe she um, committed suicide. It's sounding like Bob and his family are creating a defense for Bob and not acting like, oh my God, where's my wife? Sylvia Katz feared for the worst when she found Gail's purse in the apartment. And in her pocketbook are her keys and wallet and cigarettes. It's not making any sense to us. Gail's mother told the police she was convinced Bob was hiding something about Gail's disappearance. She also enlisted her son's help in searching for clues. She was with a detective at the time, and I was by myself in the apartment in case anybody called. My mother said, go into the bathroom and look around for anything suspicious. Look in the bathtub, look in the drain. It was somewhat unbelievable at the time actually being asked to look for my sister's remains. Gail's disappearance quickly became a hot news story with Dr. Birenbaum playing the concerned husband on TV. She's um, a graduate student. Psychology takes that very seriously. What do you think happened to your wife? I don't know. I don't know, but I'm worried. But missing persons detective Tom O'Malley saw Birenbaum as suspect number one. The doctor came in for questioning with his newly hired attorney, Scott Greenfield, and the detective quickly caught him in a lie. Birenbaum said he never suspected Gail of adultery, but Gail's lover had already told O'Malley that Birenbaum confronted him. I said, you didn't think she was cheating, but you had an argument with some guy accusing him of cheating with your wife. I said, you're doing nothing but lying. Berenbaum's cool demeanor suddenly changed. Dr. Berenbaum turned sheet white, started sweating, and I got up, and I started saying, why did you do it? Where, where is she? Now, the attorney grabbed me, very, very loud, said, stop, stop. If Greenfield wasn't there, I'm telling you, I would have had him. Birenbaum cut off all contact with the missing person squad and Gail's family. But O'Malley kept following up leads. A man named Joel Davis told the cop he saw Gail in a bagel shop the afternoon she disappeared. He said that this girl he seen was very big busted. But Elaine said her sister was totally flat chested. I knew this was not Gail he seen that day I spoke to him. I knew Dr. Birnbaum did it. The average guy with a missing wife would keep a low social profile. Not Dr. Bob. He spent his summer weekends in the Hamptons, partying like a bachelor. And at work, he played the sympathy angle for all it's worth. This guy had no shame. Birnbaum met anesthesiologist Roberta Karnofsky at the hospital and wasted no time in seducing her. Just two months after his wife disappeared, he moved Karnofsky into his and Gail's apartment. When Dr. Karnofsky asked him, well, what do you think happened to your wife? You know, her stuff is still here. 
He goes, I, you know, I really don't know. I think that she's probably out there somewhere in some sort of fugue state where she doesn't even know who she is. Late one night, police called Birnbaum at home. They'd found a disoriented woman wandering around, and she fit Gail's description. Can you come down here and see if it's her? And uh, Dr. Birnbaum says, can this wait till tomorrow? Ultimately, he does go down that night, but before he leaves, he tells Dr. Karnowski, it's, it's not her, don't worry, I'll be back. What she gets is a very chilling feeling that he knew it couldn't be her. Oh my God, he knows she's dead. Dr. Karnofsky decided to do a little investigating of her own and discovered Bob's flight log. In it, she searched for an entry dated July 7th, 1985, the day Gail disappeared. Roberta hoped her suspicions would be put to rest. Instead, they were heightened. She could see that Bob had flown that day and tried to cover it up. They have clearly altered the log to indicate that he had flown on August 7th rather than July 7th. Roberta was coming to a grisly deduction about what happened to Gail. One night at dinner, she boldly tested her theory on Bob. She said, I think that you killed your wife, that you uh, chopped her up, that you brought her up in your airplane, and then you threw her out of the airplane. He, he didn't say, you know, what are you talking about? Uh, or deny it, he simply dropped his head. Karnofsky didn't go to the police with her theory, but she was done with Bob and moved out soon after. Meanwhile, Elaine Katz mounted a campaign to open a criminal investigation into Gail's disappearance. She urged everyone who knew the couple to get involved. I sent out 100 letters to all of the people in Bob and Gail's building. I sent out 400 letters to all of the doctors that Bob worked with in the three hospitals. There was nothing that she was probably more passionate about than seeing Bob convicted of murder. Finally, the Katzes got a meeting with the district attorney's office. More than a year after Gail vanished, the DA opened a criminal investigation. When the DA's chief investigator, Andy Rosenzweig, learned that Bob was a pilot, he started canvassing local airports. He discovered what he was looking for at a small airport in Caldwell, New Jersey. And we found out quickly that uh, Bob Bierenbaum had rented a plane the day of his wife's disappearance. Rosenzweig had caught Bierenbaum in a lie of omission. He never told police he'd been in the air from 4.30 to 6.30 that day. Well, the, the bell that went off is that he had killed his wife and, uh, and used the plane as a vehicle for her disappearance and, and may have disposed of her in that way. When investigators located the plane Bob flew, they conducted a forensic search. But the Cessna was clean. Not a shred of evidence to prove that Gail had been there. Without any hard proof, the investigation once again ground to a halt. It was always troubling to me that we were never able to really reach a conclusion or bring any closure to the case and to just remain there with me. It must have been just gut-wrenching for the family. Their daughter's missing, her husband's traipsing around town, and there's absolutely nothing the cops can do. It looked like the brilliant surgeon had outsmarted everyone. Just when it looked like Gail Katz Berenbaum's disappearance would never be solved, a female torso washed up on the shores of Staten Island in 1989. The body had been surgically dismembered. An x-ray showed a break on one of the torso's bones, identical to an old injury of Gail's. Four years after she disappeared, the Katzes could finally lay their sister to rest. It is enormously relieving to know that it's her. Even though you're finding out she's dead, she's never coming back, but she's resting in peace. You know where she is, you can visit a grave. It gave us proof that she was gone. She was murdered. And now this was gonna hopefully help in bringing Bob to justice. But it didn't. Although Gail's autopsy report classified the death as a homicide, nothing implicated Birenbaum in the killing. Robert Birenbaum was a free man, 
But the media and Elaine Katz's letter writing campaign turned New York into a prison for him. Bob had two choices stay in the city under a cloud of suspicion or escape to a place where no one knew his name. In 1990, Birenbaum moved to Las Vegas. He joined a plastic surgery practice and wasted no time in pursuing the ladies. He's playing the field with a vengeance in that he's a young, single, you know, doctor. I'm a widower. In January 1995, Birenbaum went on a blind date with a woman named Carol Fisher. Her blunt sense of humor cut too close to the bone. I'm curious about his past, and I asked him, you know, do you have any baggage in your past? Asked him if he had been married, and he was really hesitant to answer that question. So in my sarcastic, humorous way, I just said, what'd you do, kill your wife? And he was very, um, gosh, just turned white when I asked that question. He was shocked, and I, of course, was shocked at his response. He was clearly uncomfortable, and he was very suspicious at that point of what I knew. He kept asking me, what, what do you know? Despite Birnbaum's reaction, Fisher dated him for six months, but finally the two called it quits. I clearly realized that this man had deep emotional problems. They weren't consistent with the facade that I had seen in him, and, and the things that I wanted to believe were Bob. Bob quickly moved on. He was looking for a wife, and within months found her. She was Janet Cholet, a 33-year-old gynecologist. But Birnbaum couldn't get a marriage license without Gail's death certificate. And when it arrived in the mail, Janet got to it first. It said, homicide. She freaks right out and starts to break off the relationship. He then begins to share his pain about being a man who is wrongly suspected. Bob persuaded Janet that he wasn't responsible for Gail's death. They were married less than six months after they met and soon left Las Vegas for Minot, North Dakota. Minot needed a plastic surgeon and Bob needed a new town. This is a man who's now fleeing his past into a third city. And he was hoping that this would be a, a good, you know, professional opportunity and a chance for another fresh start. In Minot, Beer and Bob and Janet bought a luxury condominium and found work at the local hospital. Bob was also involved with the Flying Doctors of Mercy, a group of physicians who piloted themselves to Mexico and gave medical aid to poor children. Bob does magical surgery in Mexico on these children who have cleft palates and other things. And they go down there, they do this for free. He was a very complicated guy. And maybe there was some sort of overriding guilt in him for the things that he had done. By 1997, it looked as if Birenbaum had finally rid himself of his demons and his past. Back in New York, Chief Inspector Andy Rosenzweig was about to retire. But there was one unsolved case that had been gnawing at him for more than 10 years. It, it did disturb me that he, he was... Uh free and never uh, never had the opportunity to go before the bar of justice. Twelve years after Gail disappeared, Robert Berenbaum had moved on with his life. While back in New York, the Katzes were still living in anguish. Rosenzweig knew he didn't have a lot to go on, but for the family's sake, he decided to take one last swing at the murder case. On December 3rd, 1997, Detective Andy Rosenzweig called Elaine Katz and told her he was reopening the investigation into her sister Gail's death. I was shocked. Andy felt we knew who did it, and we couldn't get him. Gail's autopsy report stoked Rosenzweig's conviction that Berenbaum was her killer. I remember the language uh, in the report saying that the limbs were surgically disarticulated. Again, Dr. Bierenbaum was a plastic surgeon. To read that language that raised it up another notch in my mind. Rosenzweig first needed to confirm that these were Gail's remains. He asked her family for permission to exhume the body. Without getting assurance that we were going to have a good shot at an indictment, I wasn't interested. 
and more so, I didn't want my sister, Elaine, to have to go through it again. It was this feeling that I found my sister, I put her someplace, she's there and she's resting in peace. I didn't want anyone to disturb her. Elaine and Stephen wrestled with their decision, then gave the go-ahead. The Katzes were stunned by the test results. Unfortunately, we found out that that torso was indeed not Gail. I was furious. I was so angry at them for taking away from me the only thing that I ever had about my sister's death that gave me a shred of peace. And I remember saying to them that now that they had, had done that, that they better prosecute Bob. I can't even imagine what Gail's siblings were going through. At this point, it was like they'd lost their sister all over again. Birnbaum needed to pay. And we just weren't going to give up. Uh, we, we owed that to the family, that we were going to see it through to the end. Investigators began searching for witnesses. Rosenzweig interviewed New York psychiatrist Dr. Michael Stone, who met with the Birnbaums after Bob choked Gail in 1983. Said that he warned her, and he actually had done that in writing, and we eventually did get a copy of the letter. Investigators headed west to Las Vegas and tracked down Bob's colleagues and girlfriends, including Carol Fisher. They were hopeful that Bob had shared details that maybe were conflicting with other people's details. In the fall of 1998, investigators talked with Roberta Karnofsky, who lived with Birenbaum in the months after Gail disappeared. She told them she had seen his flight log with an entry from July 7th, the date Gail went missing, altered to read August 7th. It was a huge break. The first piece of hard evidence which proved Bob tried to cover up his activities on the day of Gail's disappearance. The fact that he kept a flight log, we wrestled with, if there is one, how can we get it? Chief Rosenzweig felt it was time to pounce. He traveled to Minot, North Dakota to confront the surgeon. We, we were able to uh, find him in his office, sat near his car, and when he left, he was quite startled uh, to see two investigators approaching him. And I said to him, I understand you have a, an attorney, but uh, would you be willing to listen to us? And at that point, he, uh, he said, no, I, I want my attorney. You know, he's clearly still uncooperative, still not very interested in solving the disappearance of his wife, Gail. And, uh, and to me, it was a clear indication of guilt. Within a few months, the Manhattan DA convened a grand jury to hear the case. And on December 6, 1999, Robert Birenbaum was indicted for murdering his wife, Gail, 14 years earlier. Birenbaum turned himself in two days later. He was finally gonna have to answer these charges. He was no longer gonna be able to run away and hide and not face us, face my sister and myself. I felt probably for the first time that I had you know, finally done right by my sister. The press had a field day with the doctor of death story and had their cameras ready when Birenbaum finally faced Elaine Katz during the lengthy pre-trial hearings. I looked at him and I said, you know, tell me that you didn't kill my sister. Bob, why don't you tell the public that you're innocent? Why don't you tell me that you didn't kill my sister? 15 years, I'm waiting to hear you say that you didn't kill my sister. And his lawyer whisked him into an elevator, and off they went. On September 18, 2000, jury selection began. Within two weeks, Robert Birenbaum would finally be tried for murder. The DAs had their work cut out for them. They had a mountain of circumstantial evidence, but no forensics, no eyewitnesses, they didn't even have a body. Would Dr. Birenbaum pay for his crime or would he elude justice forever? On Monday, October 2nd, 2000, 
Manhattan Assistant DA Steve Sirocco delivered his opening statements to the jury at the murder trial of Dr. Robert Bierenbaum. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you're going to hear that he accounted to several people what he did that morning. Talked to the police. He never told any one of them that unequivocally he rented a plane, called to an airport, and flew it for approximately two hours on that Sunday. Bierenbaum's attorney, Scott Greenfield, tangled early on with the prosecution over the key piece of evidence in the case, Bob's flight log. There was a major legal battle in the courtroom about whether he had an obligation to deliver it, and we had to litigate that over a period of time. Ultimately, I ordered him to deliver it, and he did. He had actually doctored the flight log uh, to make it appear that he went on a different date, and he lied about that to everybody. Leslie Crocker Snyder is usually perceived as a prosecution judge. In the old days, they call a hanging judge. And Bob Birnbaum's defense would complain that all her rulings favored the prosecution and that she leaned that way. Leslie Crocker Snyder is my kind of judge. She doesn't suffer foolish legal motions lightly. Birnbaum's high-priced attorneys must have been shaking in their boots. The prosecution's first witness was Elaine Katz, who testified about Birenbaum's history of violence and his attempt to strangle Gail in 1983. It felt wonderful to be able to publicly say all of the terrible things that Bob did to Gail, um, not only to the public, but to Bob. The medical examiner then described how easily a surgeon like Birenbaum could dismember a body. He had testified that a surgeon, this would be like somebody else just cutting up a chicken. He said the body would have fit in a, you know, a duffel bag or a suitcase. The prosecution then illustrated for the jury how Birenbaum could have disposed of Gail's body. They videotaped a police pilot flying the same model Cessna that Birenbaum flew the day she disappeared. We had a New York City cop from aviation put 110 pounds of rice or sand or something in a bag, load it onto a plane, and put it on his lap, dispose of it out the, the pilot's door. I think it called it a stall maneuver, where then the door would be able to open without the pressure. It was just an incredibly compelling, dramatic, and appropriate video reenactment of how the defendant committed this murder. I think probably it helped the prosecution. Even more powerful was the testimony from Birenbaum's former girlfriends. Roberta Karnofsky told of Bob's strange behavior when the police called in the middle of the night saying they found Gail. Roberta spoke about saying, I got to get out of here. Your wife's going to come home. And Bob said to her calmly, you know, you don't have to go anywhere. It's not going to be her. How do you know that it's not her unless you know exactly why it's not her? Then Carol Fisher took the witness stand. I looked at Bob and Bob looked at me and it was very uncomfortable for me, very intimidating. I felt he was saying, you know, go easy here, Carol, and, um, you know, I didn't do this, and I'm in a bad situation. Fisher delivered an account of their first date and Birenbaum's paranoid reaction to her joke about him murdering his wife. He was shocked about how would I know that? Why would I say that? And I'm sure that was testimony that they needed to hear. After the prosecution rested, the defense surprised everyone by calling just one witness. Joel Davis testified for the jury he had seen Gail in a bagel shop the afternoon she disappeared, contradicting the prosecution's case. We put a theory out there. She's dead in the apartment. If they buy that Joel Davis is credible and accurate, the case is over. And we're, we're, simply, we're simply dead in the water. Sirocco had to prove to the jury that the woman Joel Davis had seen could not have been Gail. If he didn't, Bob would go free. He, he was describing her as voluptuous, and in fact, you know, I mean, Gail was flat-chested. I had a photo of her fairly soon before her death in a bathing suit. Very apparent how flat-chested she was. It really cast doubt completely on the veracity of their only witness. 
Sirocco ripped apart Davis's testimony during cross-examination and destroyed his credibility. He hooked him like a fish and reeled him in. The defense's whole case is resting on this guy. And he just melted down right there on the stand. Closing arguments were delivered on October 23rd. Then it was all up to the jurors. They came to a verdict after a single day of deliberation. Stephen and Elaine Katz walked out of the courthouse still reeling from the emotion of the verdict this afternoon. Dr. Robert Bierenbaum guilty of killing his first wife 15 years ago, even though her body was never found. I was prepared for the worst. I was scared. I collapsed. I was crying. I was crying. Tears of joy, tears of relief, emotional release, you know, relief that it was over. And then it was just a overwhelming feeling that we finally did it. It was a good feeling. 15 years after he murdered Gail, Dr. Robert Bierenbaum was sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. Today, Elaine Katz is a legal advocate for victims of domestic violence. She works with the Women's Justice Center at New York's Pace University Law School. They're an organization that is a support to the local legal community. The money that we raise goes to the kinds of programs that I really believe are not only saving women today, but would have saved my sister indeed. I want this message to go out that you don't get away with it. Even in a case where nobody thought he would ever get convicted. Years later, no forensic evidence, no body. I wanted a message to batterers. I wanted a message to victims. Robert Bierenbaum thought he was so smart he could get away with murder. And he almost did. The promising young doctor now grows old in a prison cell. The Katz family can finally remember Gail in peace. For Court TV, I'm Dominic Dunn.